How do you do? They say life is what happens while you're making other plans. Better yet, time and chance happens to them all. The young woman in this story was planting flowers in her yard when she felt dizzy, a warning sign. Chance happening. But this medical emergency led her to a place where her heart and mind and life were unshackled. Where are we going, Kyle? To the nearest hospital. It's probably just a migraine. Migraines don't cause seizures, Laura. I had a seizure? You don't remember? I I just suddenly felt a lot worse. Sunstroke, maybe. Whatever it is, I, I don't like it. You need help. Introducing a friend that sticks closer than a brother. This is Unshackled. True life stories of real people dramatized and produced in Chicago by Pacific Garden Mission. Homeless people don't carry many obvious burdens, but they do carry invisible ones. Failure and despair that they try to hide behind impassive expressions. But the heart knoweth his own bitterness, and the folks at the mission know the answer to their inner pain. Each day, hundreds of men, women, and children receive food, fresh clothing, and a safe place to sleep at the mission because friends like you send financial gifts to keep the doors open at Pacific Garden Mission. And each day, hundreds of hurting people find peace and purpose at the old lighthouse. Mission pastors and counselors introduce them to the only friend who can change their lives forever as they receive the cure for bitterness, the truth that makes them free. Now for broadcast around the earth, here is program number 3,477 in the series... Unshackled, the program that makes you face yourself and think. Uh, Mr. Barnett. Yes, doctor, and this is Laura's mother. How's my daughter? Well, uh, she's in a coma. How long did she have symptoms? Uh, She lay on the couch for several hours. She thought it was a migraine. What's wrong with her? Well, uh, we're still doing tests, but we're pretty sure she had a stroke. But Laura's only 23. Strokes happen to old people. A stroke can happen any time to anyone. It's imperative to get medical attention right away. Will she be all right? It's too soon to know all the ramifications, but she may have paralysis. The magnitude of the stroke was far worse than expected. This is the story of her survival. The true testimony of Laura Barnett, right now on Unshackled. Kyle and I had been married for only a year when this unexpected calamity struck. We had bought a home in Lake Zurich, Illinois, where I was planting flowers, when dizziness impelled me to lie on the grass and then forced me inside where I lay until convulsions hit. Two weeks passed, and when I opened my eyes, I was completely paralyzed from the nose down. I couldn't speak and didn't know why. All I could do was blink my eyes. Laura, we're going to ask you some questions. Blink once if the answer is no, and blink twice if the answer is yes. Do you understand? Two blinks. She understands. Are my eyes blue? One blink. She says no. Are they brown? She blinked twice. She does understand. Fantastic. I still didn't know what had happened to me. I could think and see, but couldn't communicate or move. Another two weeks passed, and one day I laughed at something Kyle did. My laugh sounded guttural, almost like a braying donkey. But I had made a sound, and being able to laugh gave me hope. I didn't sleep well, however, and a night nurse often came and talked to me for hours. People tend to blame God when life goes off the rails because God is sovereign. But the Lord allows trouble so we'll reach out to Him. He wants good things for your life, and He can create good out of your situation. Trust Him. Remember that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I have faith that God will restore your speech and your ability to walk, but you must have faith too. You'll be starting the tilt table this week, and that should help. I'm praying for your recovery, so don't give up. Her voice reminded me that I was still part of the human race, but God was irrelevant to me, though I was raised in parochial schools Dad always insisted that we attend church until we were 18, and as I left for college, 
I left God behind. Each day, nurses let me know what day it was, and about six weeks after I lay immobilized, Mom and Kyle were visiting again. I was only half listening until something Mom said caught my attention. They say it's because Laura had a stroke. But she's so young. She should be making progress. Well, Dr. Lee says they call it the locked-in syndrome because Laura feels as if she's trapped with no way to express herself. <sighs> she's a prisoner in her own body. Exactly. She's aware but can't communicate verbally. Her voluntary muscles are paralyzed, except the eyes. Who would have thought it was a stroke in someone so young? What else did the doctor say? Well, it's extremely rare for any motor function to return. 90% of patients remain locked in for five years, or they die. That was when I learned I'd had a stroke. I was determined to get better and graduated from the tilt table to a wheelchair from which I went to physical therapy, or I could sit in the hall and watch daily activities. My right arm came back first, but I still lacked the strength or coordination to hold a pen or pencil, so I learned to use a board with letters to spell out words. At the end of four months in the hospital, I could walk slowly with a cane and was allowed to go home. Take it easy, Laura. Take I'm your time. I'm glad the nurse is coming tomorrow. Laura can't be alone yet. The nurse is going to take her to the dental clinic in Chicago to get her fitted for a palatal lift. Did you hear that, Laura? You may be able to speak again soon. I don't know if I'm ready for that. I kind of like having a silent wife. <laughs> At least I can still make her laugh. The nurse took me to Chicago once a week for two months until I was fitted with a device. I was determined to speak, and the palatal lift helped me to make weak, vocalized sounds. During that time, I relearned to drive a car, and the nurse was dismissed. A year after my stroke, Mother took me to Chicago, where the dentist adjusted the palatal lift. The speech therapist taught me how to force my breath to make sounds, and all the way home, I practiced reading signs as Mom drove. That palatal lift is making a huge difference in your speech, Laura. Huge. Yes, huge. You're reading most of the signs. Bump. Did you say pump? No. I said bump. Use more breath. Yes. We're almost home. Oh, Kyle's truck is there. He'll be surprised. Kyle was so elated to hear my voice that he twirled me around in circles. But few people could understand me, especially when I was excited. The telephone was scary because listeners sometimes had no idea what I said. Some even hung up on me, but I kept trying. I could be left alone now and even volunteered in the medical records department of the hospital where I got therapy. Kyle would go out on Friday evening after work, which I didn't mind, Unless he didn't call me. You still up? Why didn't you call me? You know I sometimes go out on Friday night. You could call. Don't control me, Laura. Understand? I was horrified as Kyle mangled a serving cart I used to help me walk and carry things. He also destroyed a light fixture over the dining room table. I was so shocked at his rage that I couldn't even cry out, but my legs shook so badly I had to sit down. Ignoring the mess, he fell into bed. In the morning, Kyle cleaned things up and left for work before I arose. He apologized and replaced the serving cart and light fixture. When Kyle and I couldn't have a baby, we began fostering children. And after five years, we adopted a girl of 14 who'd been with us four years. Joni was a joy. That same year, I got my first service dog, Jabba. Look at that. Jabba can pick up the key. He can turn off lights. And open a door. Can he make coffee in the morning? <laughs> he knows 40 different commands. That's amazing. I'm going to train you like that, Laura. Kyle supported me in every way he could. When I took classes at a local community college, he bought me a scooter to get around campus, a scooter I learned to take apart and put in the car with my one good arm. 
When I began writing about my stroke experience, Kyle gave me a word processor to facilitate my writing. Kyle always worked hard at his job, but he also drank so much he sometimes vomited in bed. Kyle had many DWIs. When Joni and I started going to church, my dog walked with us, replacing a cane as I walked. But Kyle refused to go. I also started watching TV preachers. Now when Cain killed his brother Abel, God asked Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? But God already knew. You see, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. And what did Cain reply? How should I know? Am I my brother's keeper? Well, yes, you are. God saved us by his grace and mercy, and the least we can do in return is share the good news and be careful to maintain good works. God's word was softening my heart. Many nights when I couldn't sleep, I would lie on the couch and listen to Christian radio until I fell asleep. My heart was growing receptive to spiritual things, but I couldn't communicate this to Kyle. I laughed too hard and long, or cried very easily and couldn't stop. And talking about God made me cry. This emotional instability is called pseudo-bulbar affect, though back then it was called lability. Besides, Kyle had no interest in faith. The closer I was drawn to God, the more estranged we became. We'll hear the rest of Laura's story in just a moment. Here's the president of Pacific Garden Mission, Phil Kwiatkowski. Thanks, Timothy. Women are just as likely as men to become homeless because of family breakdown or addiction issues. But we have a women's division to help them. Sometimes the police or the courts send them to us for a night's stay to get them off the streets. But as they see love in action from mission counselors and guests, and as they hear the good news of the Lord Jesus can change any life, hope is stirred in them. First, they have to want to change. Then, while they can sign up for the New Life program and stay in our women's dormitory while they grow in faith, increasing in the knowledge of God. For more information about this vital ministry to women, check our website, www.unshackled.org, or write to Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. Our email address is unshackled at pgm.org. I learned so much from my service dog. His unconditional love made me wonder if that was the way God loved us. Just the thought of God brought me to tears. I didn't understand and had to avoid situations that caused an emotional meltdown. In March 1994, I was pushing a laundry cart at home when I felt peace wash over me, like a breeze. I had to sit down as peace flooded my heart. I took out my Bible and reread verses I had recently heard. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. <laughs> If our earthly house were dissolved, we have a building of God, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. When I die, I will get a new body. Scripture became more transparent to me after that day when God's grace flowed down on me. But sharing with others, especially Kyle, was nearly impossible. My throat would constrict and I would weep uncontrollably or laugh hysterically at the joy of salvation and then be out of control, unable to stop laughing and crying. Lability is debilitating. Even so, radio preachers help me grow in faith. We are born with a God-shaped vacuum in our soul that only God himself can fill. People try to fill it with other things like relationships, alcohol, materialism, you name it. But the great I am says, fill your life with me. 
In other words, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What are you trying to say, Laura? We have a God-shaped vacuum. God has a vacuum? He probably needs it. (laughs) What? Speak! I was saved. From what? I belong to God now. Uh, You know I don't care about that stuff. (gasps) But, Kyle... Keep it to yourself! Praying was hard for me, but I prayed for Kyle. I also started a Bible study in our home, but I didn't try to lead it because speaking was so difficult. I couldn't articulate words with enough volume to be understood. I learned so much about Christ as the months passed, but I kept my spiritual insights to myself. And so, God wants us to be rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. God is doing something in our lives. Suffering is not meaningless. He hasn't forsaken us. Instead of doubting, start praying. Ask God for strength, encouragement, comfort, and help. Wrestle with the Lord day in and day out. A year after my salvation, I took a bus to Chicago with my service dog for a checkup with a dentist. She said my soft palate was coming back, and possibly I wouldn't need the palate to lift. I controlled my tears until I got home, where I wept and praised God for this healing. Life with Christ has not been trouble-free. I've had several broken bones and two brain surgeries due to falling. This is getting to be a bad habit, Laura, visiting you in the hospital. Sorry. Ah. Is Joni coming? Said she would, yeah. Hey, Dad. How's Mom doing? Ask her yourself. She's awake. Hi, Mom. What happened? She's getting careless, that's what. Or maybe she was secretly drinking. (laughs) Not a chance. Well, I'll let you two visit. Good night, Laura. Good night, This accident won't set you back, Mom. You're a fighter. The brain surgeries didn't help me speak any better, but I was slowly gaining control of the inappropriate laughing and sobbing of lability. But Kyle was drifting further and further from me. Oh, what are you doing up? Waiting for you? I was just visiting with the neighbor. You're... Having an affair. That's a lie. How dare you accuse me of something like that? I can't stand that green-eyed monster inside of you. You make me sick! Besides his violent outburst, I began to notice a personality change in Kyle, and I thought it was because of me. Kyle would hardly talk to me at all. If I asked him a question, he would just grunt. But when we saw our friends and relatives, he was his old, jovial self. I thought, it is me. We argued so much about important issues, I thought we should see a marriage counselor. Kyle agreed, as long as it was a non-Christian one. Nothing was accomplished, and I could no longer take the tension at home. Hello? Joni, can you help me? What do you need, Mom? I'm moving out. To where? To my mother's. What about Dad? We don't get along. Okay, I'll come right over. Mom was 85 when I moved in with her. A priest from a local church counseled Kyle and me, and after six weeks of separation, I moved back in with Kyle. Early the following year, we drove to Florida for a two-week vacation, taking my service dog with us. After a week in Tampa, Kyle told me the real purpose of our trip. Laura, I'm going to a drug treatment center in Boca Raton tomorrow. 
You are? You know I'm addicted to alcohol, but I'm, I'm also addicted to prescription pain meds. Vicodin, hydrocodone. I, I get sick whenever I stop taking them. How long? How long will I be in treatment? Ten days? I called, and they can take me tomorrow. What about me? I'll, I'll put you in a hotel near the center. After a week, Kyle talked them into letting him go home because he was also a workaholic. Back home, Kyle attended AA meetings while I went to Al-Anon. A year later, Kyle began drinking. I realized he was taking pills again when he stopped talking to me. Weeks turned into months, and I could hardly stand the cold shoulder. My mother died in 2009. How old was Grandma? Ninety. Being blind from glaucoma and with her bad hip, she was probably ready to go. She died on my dad's birthday. Well, it was a nice service for her. Here comes Dad with the car. He was really talkative today. He never talks to me. Really? That must be awkward. It's called silent violence. I attended Al-Anon for five years, and I learned not to take things personally when Kyle was upset with me. His addictions made him unpredictable. Even so, the silent treatment became unbearable. We didn't communicate and we led separate lives. Finally, in 2010, with the help of friends, I moved into a retirement home, taking my service dog with me. Residents lavished affection on him. One of my friends from church came to see me. <laughs> He's a great animal, Laura. So obedient and calm, well, even here. Yes. Are you doing okay here? Yes. I feel free. Well, that's wonderful. And your husband, how did he take your leaving? With sarcasm. Hmm. God tells us to stay with an unbelieving spouse as long as they're pleased to stay with us. But Kyle's silent treatment revealed his displeasure. He doesn't want God. We're all praying that the Lord will save him. Me too. Did you cry when you left? Not one tear. I had married the man of my dreams, a man I loved, and Kyle was happy with me before my stroke when I drank with him in bars. I admired Kyle for staying with me after my calamitous stroke, but his rejection of Jesus, who gave me life, lessened my admiration of Kyle and created a chasm between us. A year after I moved into the retirement home, I received an unsettling call from the bank. Friends and family urged me to see an attorney. Laura, your husband's withdrawn most of the money from his 401k? Yes. Okay, so if the bank called to alert you, then you're still the beneficiary. Yes. So the money is technically his, so he has the legal right to take it. Now, do you have separate bank accounts? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, any idea why he needed such a large sum of money? No. All right. Well, I advise you then to file for legal separation to protect you from any debts your husband has incurred. When I filed for separation, Kyle filed for divorce. Each of us had to show the other our bank records and credit card statements. Kyle had many debts, mostly from liquor stores. But God protected me, and our divorce was final six months later. I know God hates divorce, but the Lord may use this to bring Kyle to salvation. That same year, I fell and broke my hip. How are you doing, Mom? Fine. Did you lose your balance again? Yes. Well, now you'll have a good rest. I'm gonna rewrite my book. You are? That's a big challenge. New title. Blink 
twice for yes. <laughs> Very clever. More catchy than the other title. Thank you. Dad is still in Oregon. Should I let him know you're in the hospital? No. Just pray for him. The first draft of my manuscript, written before the Lord saved me, was all about me. As I lay in the hospital, I saw that God had healed me, and I wanted to tell others how Jesus had drawn me to himself and redeemed me. So I have rewritten the book. I'm confined to a wheelchair now, but my trusty right arm enables me to live semi-independently. This testimony was narrated as if my thoughts were being broadcast, because my audible speech, for many, is hard to understand. Someday, God will give me a new body, including a voice to praise Him for His unspeakable gift. Listening friend, you may have great plans for your life, but what if you were to die today? Are you ready to face the Lord? The Bible says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Your sin condemns you. But Jesus Christ made a way for you to stand before God without fear. His blood shed on the cross. He took on your sins because he loves you so much. If you would like to receive Christ as Savior, pray with us now. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose again to live forevermore. Thank you for your sacrifice. Save me, Lord. Come into my life and make me your own. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us know you prayed and we'll send you some literature to help you walk in new life. The address is Pacific Garden Mission. 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. The telephone number in Chicago, 312-492-9410. Our email address is unshackled at pgm.org. Visit our website to learn more about this ministry, unshackled.org. Tell others about this program that lights the way. And please remember to thank the manager of this station for bringing you Unshackled. This is program number 3477. Heard in the true story of Laura Barnett were Judith Easton, Tim Frank, Tricia Grennan, David Brian Stewart, and Jennifer Dimmitt. Original music, Don Badorf. Sound, PGM staff. Engineer David Pierczynski, script Kenitha Gabler, and I'm Timothy Gregory. Unshackled is produced by Pacific Garden Mission to show through true stories that if your life is empty, it can be filled to overflowing. Please write today. Your letter means a great deal to us. The address? Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. You may call Pacific Garden Mission in Chicago and talk with someone who cares. 312-492-9410 Someone is waiting for your call. 312-492-9410